with studied nonchalance from Beisage de la Heifelt by Hermann Charles Bosman, recently republished in Mariku Moon. During the past weeks, I have been living on a farm on the Mulder's Drift Road, 13 miles out of town. A private bus passes the farm at about six o'clock in the morning on the way to the city. At that hour it is still dark and it is not always easy to distinguish from the glare of the headlights between the bus and the farm trucks carrying agricultural produce to market. Consequently, there are no regular bus stops on the route. I have to describe the accepted hitchhiker's arc with my thumb each time I see the headlights. Sometimes, when I have signalled a lorry and the vehicle happens to draw up, I get a lift as far as Newtown. The fascination of driving along the country roads on the outskirts of Johannesburg in the early dawn has not yet begun to pall me, and I have several times wondered why our South African artists don't paint the early morning landscape more often, when the copies and the valleys are swimming in mists, and the plantations are dark masses with soft grey light behind them, and the blurred horizons are wrapped in theology. Instead of which, our painters almost invariably limit themselves to canvases of landscapes in the full glare of day, or with a flamboyant sunrise or sunset effects. Perhaps they leave that part of the day alone, that part of the day before the sky is red, because it is so much more difficult to catch those grissious tones, leaden and ashen silver tints, and neutral greens and patches that are the colour of doves' wings. It is not just anybody that can cover a canvas with different kinds of slaty greys and still not make the thing look like a night scene. It takes a real artist to paint a landscape in dun shades and yet to reveal it as a world filled with morning's clear light. It is also difficult to get that particular part in the morning onto canvas because it is an effect that doesn't stay very long. In about ten minutes time the sky is streaked with crimson and the magic of the grey light is gone and you are left with orthodox Sunrise on the Felt. Another reason why paintings of the misty pre-sunrise morning are rare in South African art is because it is hard for the South African artist to get up that early. When I was at the Cape recently, I was often made acutely unhappy in the course of a ramble along, say, Camps Bay Beach, or, for that matter, the Musenberg or the Somerset Strand, through the circumstances that every hundred yards or so I would be confronted with a typical South African artist's painting of a seascape. Azure skies and ultramarine ocean and brown rocks in the left foreground. It was all such obvious beauty, colour, composition, everything. Just the sort of painting that the general public thrills to. Every other hundred yards I was confronted by yet another picture painted by a second-rate artist. I saw thousands of these second-rate paintings along the Cape beaches and they were an interminable source of distress to me. All they needed 
with frames. After a while, it seemed to me that a lot of those paintings actually were framed, and that some of the frames even had little red tabs on them. One day, after I had passed a large number of daubs like that, all in a row, I found myself absent-mindedly putting my hand in my pocket for the catalogue. I knew then that I must never again take a stroll along any part of the Cape Peninsula seafront. But it's different speeding along Transvaal Heifelt roads a few miles outside Johannesburg by bus or farm lorry in the dew-drenched light of a new day before the sun is up. This is a different class of work altogether. For one thing, a lot of it is in watercolours. Swift strokes with a full brush, as often as not flung down, apparently just anyhow, on soaking wet paper, with breathtaking mastery, and with a superb carelessness of certainty. And it is all early Impressionism, before the Impressionists became mathematicians. And just outside Johannesburg municipal area, there is a magnificent example of near fauvism an extraordinary piece of work, a thrilling smudge of dark trees with silver light breaking through them against a background of blurred hills and earthy sky. There is also an interesting painting higher up along the Mulder's Drift Road with rows of trees and a couple of farmhouses carefully laid out in accordance with a complicated system of receding planes. But while I can admire the cleverness of this canvas very much, it doesn't make a strong and direct emotional appeal to me. I can sense in it the beginning of the trompe d'oreil decadence of the last years of the 19th century. The last piece of early Impressionism on the road comes into view at the very moment of sunrise. I can't just at the moment recall the name of this picture, and I can't make out the artist's signature, which looks like a scrawled G with some wrigglings after it, which makes me think that it might be Gauguin before he went to the South Seas. On the other hand, it might equally be an S, with some scribblings after that. Surat, perhaps. I have often wondered. I have asked the bus driver, but he doesn't know. Postscript. It is springtime on the farm. The almond trees and the apple trees, the peach, and apricot and cherry trees are covered in pink and white blossom. And I, neurotic city dweller, whom the spring times of the last four or five years have passed by with studied nonchalance, bring me neither enchantment, nor rapture, nor heartache. Gaze upon the annual miracle of bursting blooms without the awakening of memories and without wonderment. <laughs>